Well, good morning, church. Good morning, students. It's a good day, right? There you go. It's always good to gather as a church, and it's always good to worship God together. And that's what we do today, and we get to do this. Man, we're just so blessed. God is so good to us, isn't he? Well, I'm glad y'all think so. Y'all should probably believe that as well. Hey, it's good this morning to worship God, especially on this Palm Sunday. Uh, all Sundays are good, but Palm Sunday is pretty awesome too, leading up to Easter. And so I want to encourage you this morning to grab one of these on your way out. It's a little devotional our team put together to help you journey through the week of Holy Week as we pause every single day leading up to Easter Sunday. And actually, it starts on Palm Sunday, so you have to get it today to start on today's devotion because if you're OCD, you're going to be off all week. And no one wants that. But wait, there's more. Yeah, some of you got that refreshed. There's more. There's an invite card in these booklets as well. And you know what that means? That means you get to invite someone to Easter services next week. Easter is such an opportunity for us to introduce people to our King, to our Lord Jesus. And so I want to encourage you guys to take a chance, take a moment, grab one of these, grab one of these, pray all week, do the devotions, invite someone, pray for that someone. And on Easter Sunday, let's see what God does. Is that a good deal? All right. So moving on, if you have your Bibles this morning or on your phones, or if you know what this is, this is a book, um, you can go ahead and turn to you, um, the book of Ephesians in chapter 6 as we get this morning to continue our journey through this letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And um, we've been doing this for a while now, and as you probably know, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we've been able to just pause and to refocus on this section in chapter 6 that's called the Armor of God. And so over the last two weeks, uh, we've started this, and today we will be focusing our attention on uh, verse 14, when Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. But it's always helpful to read the Word of God in the context of Scripture. It helps us understand it better. So I would invite you guys to stand with me this morning as we read in chapter 6, starting in verse 10, and we stand in reverence of God who gave us His Word, because by His grace, God still speaks today. So from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through verse 17, and you probably will have it memorized by the time we're done with this series. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you still speak to us. We thank you, Father, that your word is as living and active, as powerful, as sharp. And so I pray, Father, this morning as we take this time, as we worship you corporately together by singing and by praying, Father, we continue our worship this morning by listening to your voice, to, by listening to your word. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us to see what you show us, help us to hear what you tell us, and Father, help us to, to just simply follow in obedience. I pray, God, that you would speak for your servants are listening. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And thank you for standing in reverence for God and his word. Now, some of you know me better than others, but I'm obviously not from around these parts. We all have an accent. I just happen to have a South African accent. And, you know, I, I get to be an immigrant to the United States. I'm a citizen now. Actually, this week was my 10-year anniversary of becoming a citizen of the United States. Right? But I also get to be South African, so you see, uh -huh, double blessing. And, and, and one of those things is I get to be an immigrant to the South. Now, the Deep South is, is, is a whole different level of the United States, right? Uh, not just because of culture. Uh, let me just tell you right now, barbecue and cornbread is awesome. Uh, no one else does it, but that's still awesome. 
But one of the things I love about traveling, I love about cultures is language, is how we speak, is how we talk, is, is the words we use. And, and, and let me just tell you right now, for someone who's traveled a lot, the South is next level. The South is like a level unto its own. It's a whole different universe of language and words and expressions and idioms and so forth. Now, they, they are the ones that are just flat out funny. They have meaning, but they're just ridiculously funny, right? Uh, I remember years ago, I was pastoring a church and every Sunday morning, I would walk over to this lady, kind of like second pew from the back, center block, to you right now. And I would walk over to her and I would say, hey, Ms. Verdi, how you doing today? And Ms. Verdi would just stay seated. She would look at me straight in the eye, not a smile, nothing. And she would say, hey, pastor, good morning. I'm doing fine, fine as frog hair. I was like, who's ever heard of frog with hair? This morning in the second service, another lady came to me. She said, hey, pastor, it's not, it's not fine as frog hair. It's fine as frog hair split nine times. What? But that's the South for you, right? Then there's other expressions that we use um, in the South, you know, beyond the y'alls and the yonders, which are just epic. There's other expressions we love to use, right? Uh, say, for instance, uh, my, my sons play baseball. You know, they really do play baseball, by the way. And um, the first, first practice, the coach walks over, tells my son, hey, take that bat and give that ball a good lick. Why would you lick a ball? <laughs> Amen? You don't sound convinced. No, no, we have these expressions, and there's so many more. You should see after two services how many expressions I've been told walking out of the service. But then there's one of those that, that I like, too, that just confuses me sometimes. Um, uh, you know, you, you don't know if you should be grateful or you should hate the person. But, but when, when you do something and, 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 that, and that person comes to you and they say, oh, bless your heart. You don't know whether she insulting you inside or is she truly wanting what's, what's good for you. Like, just bless your heart. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Mike, you got it. <laughs> then there's this expression, right? Like, oh, that just ain't right. That ain't right. It's wrong. Add about five more syllables and they're wrong. <laughs> right? That's just not right. It's not how it's supposed to be. Well, ironically, and not so ironically, we're talking about that this morning. When uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he tells them to put on the breastplate of righteousness, it's important for us to understand what righteousness is and what the breastplate is. Righteousness, simply put, is when things are as they ought to be, when it's right, when it's not wrong. So let's begin maybe with the most obvious statement you'll hear this morning. And that is that you need the breastplate to battle with confidence. Now, I don't know how much experience and how much uh, 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 desire you have to know about warfare in the first century or really in modern warfare as well. But the fact of the matter is that you could not go into a battle, pretty much any battle, when people are shooting arrows, throwing spears and lances and rocks and whatever else at you to try and, and defeat you. You had to wear some kind of protection to protect your upper body. Why? Well, this is a lot of real estate to hurt, especially in my case. It's a lot of real estate. It's, it's, there's a lot to protect, right? And so they had to wear this thing called a breastplate, which sometimes was an actual plate that was hammered along the body or the, the form or the shape of the soldier. I actually have a picture of that for you. See? I mean, that was pretty neat. It was like lined with leather and metal, and it was pretty strong, and, and, and you know, it, it did its job. So Roman soldiers had another kind of armor sometimes that looked a bit more like this. A bunch of metal bands riveted together that just kind of shape around your body. It's much lighter and it's much cheaper to manufacture. I'm not trying to sell it, I promise, but that's what it was. Then, even in the Middle Ages, you know, uh, armor was a thing, right? I mean, try and run in that baby, right? Good luck. Now, now modern war warfare or futuristic warfare may look more like this. I don't know if that breastplate works. Maybe it helps them shooting better, I don't know. But, but, but the breastplate was a thing, right? And, and, and it's still a thing because we cannot walk, we cannot fight exposed. You have to protect yourself in order to fight more efficiently. You have to protect yourself because you know what? A wounded or a dead soldier is no good on the battlefield. You have to protect yourself. You have to protect yourself in this war. And so the breastplate protected not just the real estate, but really protected the vital organs, protected mainly the heart. 
the heart of the warrior. This was vital. If you didn't notice, the heart is a vital organ. But so they were wearing this thing to protect their heart. And, and, and it's so appropriate that Paul, understanding what is going on, is telling the church in Ephesus, therefore, one of the most important things that you can do to protect yourself and to, to fight more adequately and more efficiently is to protect your heart. Why protect your heart? It's important to talk about that. Why is it important to protect our heart? Well, first of all, you need a heart. But then beyond that, since the dawn of time, from the beginning of time, we know when we see that the enemy has been out to attack the heart of humanity, the heart of mankind. He has sought to tear up and to destroy your heart, my heart, from Adam and Eve to us to the end of times. That is what Satan does. Can I pause that? I, I don't know where your walk in life is today. I, I don't know how you feel about God, how you feel about spirituality, how you feel about religion, and all these things we're talking about this morning. And I'm just grateful you're here today. But you need to know that Satan is real. You need to know that the devil is real. That he is the enemy of us and the enemy of God. That he is the heavenly being fallen from heaven, as the Bible tells us. But that he is out to get you. And his favorite tactic is your heart. And history shows us that. The Bible shows us that. I mean, think about Adam and Eve. What does Satan go after in Genesis 2? The heart. Think about Moses. Who, what does Satan go after? The heart. Think about Abraham, Sarah. What does Satan go after? The heart. Think about King Saul. His pride is his heart. Think about King David. What does Satan go after? His heart. Think about all the prophets in the Old Testament. Satan goes after their hearts. Think about the prophet Elijah. Struggling with depression. Struggling with his, 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 his fighting these same spiritual powers. What does Satan go after? His heart. Think about the New Testament. Think about the apostle Peter. The devil goes after his heart. The heart is not just the seat of our affections. The heart is not just where we love and where we care or sometimes where we hate. The, the, the heart is, is even more than that. It's the seat of, of our loves. It's the seat of our fears. It's the seat of our hopes. It's the seat of our pride. It's the seat of everything that sums up who we are. If I were to ask you this morning, who are you? Whatever your answer is, your heart. Is what you love most, is what you value most, is what you think defines you. And that is why Satan puts his evil finger on that and he presses really hard because he wants to redefine you. He goes for the heart. He goes for the heart and he will always attack where it hurts most. He's going to attack the answer to the question, who am I? So not only do you need a breastplate to fight with confidence, you need more than just any breastplate. You, you know what the Apostle Paul is not saying in this passage? He's not saying, put on the pajamas of righteousness. He's not saying, put on your t-shirt of righteousness. He's saying, put on the breastplate of righteousness. You need something that is right, something that is adequate, something that fits the task at hand. You need to be able to be confident on the battlefield. And let's face it, my PJs ain't going to do it. My t-shirt is not going to do it. My suit and coat's not going to do it. What I need is a breastplate. And Paul says very specifically, a breastplate of righteousness. The weapons that we don, the weapons that we take, the armor that we carry are a direct reflection of our perception of the enemy. If you think that the enemy is cute and cuddly, if you think the enemy is just a thought, is just a philosophy, if you think that the enemy is something made up or a social construct, then my friend, your enemy and your, your, your armor and your, 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 and, and your weapons will reflect your understanding of the enemy. If you take the enemy seriously, then you will wear the armor and take up the weapons that are adequate for that fight. That is strategy, tactics 101, right weapon for the right fight. Right weapon for the right fight because we need to be able to fight more confidently when we are confident 
in our equipment. There's no doubt that it's probably the reason Paul even begins this passage with that statement when he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his mind. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Now put on this armor. Now put on this armor. We need something that can withstand the weapons of the enemy. We need the right kind of equipment to withstand those arrows that he lobs at you, at your heart. Those spears that he throws at you, at your heart. Those rocks that he catapults at you, at your heart. You need the right equipment. You need what it takes to withstand these attacks. So how then is this breastplate of righteousness an efficient weapon to fight the good fight? I think we've established that we need to protect the heart. We're good? But we need to talk about how this happens. How is this protected? And I'm going to tell you right now, folks, this word righteousness is a word that is heavy, that is dripping with meaning and with theology. And there's no way that I can unpack the whole word in the time I'm allotted. So another two hours. There's no way. I'm kidding. You're not here for another two hours. Maybe. Maybe. There's no way we can unpack it all, but, but, but we need to, to at least understand the basics. And like I said earlier, the, if you go to the root of the word righteousness in the Bible, it carries this meaning of as it ought to be, as it is meant to be, as it should be. Now, the question is, well, what is it supposed to be like? How ought it to be? Who decides that? Well, the standard decides that. And the standard is God. In the same way we say love your enemies, God is not saying love your enemies like humans do, which is usually pretty terribly. No, love your enemies like I do, like God does, because God is love. God is the source of love. God pours out true and pure love. We don't say go and show justice in the middle of injustice the way humans do. Because that usually doesn't work out that great either. I know God says work justice like I do because God is infinitely and most holy just. So show that kind of justice, the justice from the heart of God. In the same way, when God says go and be righteous, he's not saying just be righteous according to your standards. Go do a couple of really good things. Make sure all your buddies think you're a good person. You're good to go. You're righteous. No, no, he's talking about righteousness that's much heavier, much more robust in that. The kind of righteousness that is not a pajama of faith, but the kind of righteousness that can withstand the arrows and the spears and the tactics and the schemes of the enemy. The righteousness of God is an attribute of God's eternal protection as the standard of what is right. And the Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God. But the Bible also shows us from the beginning, our rebellion and our sinfulness said, God, I don't want it your way. I'd rather do my way. And very quickly, we find out that it's just not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. Our sinfulness and our rebellion pulls us away from the way we are meant to be. But throughout scripture, you will see a desire that flows from the heart of God for all of us to be righteous as we were meant to be, as we were created to be. Now, let me also just say this. Many of you are already thinking, okay, he's going to go be saved, get saved. Well, yes, but, but I, I will submit to you this morning that when Paul talks about righteousness, his focus is not on salvation. His focus is not necessarily there. It's included, but it's not the whole picture. How do I know that? Because a couple of lines over, he talks about the helmet of salvation. So what would he distinguish? Well, let Pastor Clay clear that up for us in a couple of weeks. But when he talks about righteousness, it's important for us to understand that righteousness is not a simple word. Like it says a heavy word that drips with meaning, right? In fact, Paul even writes to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. He talks about the breastplate of faith and love. You're going to say, well, hang on. I thought we were talking about the breastplate of righteousness. We are. But you say faith and love. We are. Those are two things. Yep. I'm glad our education works out. That's two things. 
You, you see, it, it may be helpful for us to understand and to think about righteousness in, in terms of adoption. So, so often, God uses this image of adoption in the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, a few times, actually. So think about it like this. Adoption, just like righteousness, has two movements, has two dimensions to it, okay? So, if you don't know me, I have three sons. Uh, I have an 11-year-old. I have a nine-year-old. He just turned nine. That's why I have to think about it. And I have a six-year-old, right? In about three weeks, maybe four weeks, Lord willing, my wife and I will get on an airplane and we will fly out to Asia to go, Lord willing, be united with our daughter, which we are adopting as well. So pray for that, please. But I have that six-year-old, and you know what? That six-year-old is also adopted. Now, here's the deal. Adoption is not just, okay, I signed the papers and now we're done. It's, it's not, no, trust me, it's not. Adoption is a journey, but that journey begins with that moment when a family is united. When that little boy, at the time we adopted him, he was 17 months old, walks into a room and I see my wife fall on her knees and embrace that little boy because she had been waiting for that boy for many years. And in that moment, I knew God had brought together a, 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 a woman and a boy that were meant to be together. In that moment, adoption took place. My wife embraced that son and I embraced my wife and my son, and we were now a family along with the other two boys we have. That's the first movement, the first dimension of adoption is that embracing. But then the adoption journey continues because for the last five years, that little boy now has had this journey of walking with us and learning the ways of our family, learning how to love his brothers and his mother and his father and his cousins and his aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. And friends, that little boy has spent years trying to just understand and figure out life. That boy is trying to learn how are we a family. In the same way, in the very same way, righteousness in the Bible has two dimensions. There's the coming together. And then there's the going together. Theologians use big words, I'm sorry, but they talk about this first movement as positional righteousness or how righteousness speaks to who we are through Christ. I need you to hang with me for just a second, but this is so important. In the Old Testament, time and time again, God justifies his covenant people, his chosen people, declaring them righteous because of their repentance and because of their trust and seeking his ways. But as you read the New Testament, you see that these people keep breaking away from God. It just reveals their heart is broken. Their heart desires its own ways. Their heart is not really that interested in how it ought to be, but rather how we want it to be. But then God sends an answer. God provides Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we are all sinners. We are all in need of justification. And that is why Jesus sends Christ. We're all unrighteous, and because of our unrighteousness, we deserve death and separation from God, but Christ comes to reconcile us to God, to become our righteousness. The perfect Son of God takes our place. The perfect Son of God covers our sin and our iniquities, said the Bible, and becomes our righteousness. So when God looks at us, he sees him who is perfectly righteous. And even though we all fall short of the standard of God, God declares us righteous. It's not anything we did, however hard we tried, but simply because we believe that Christ was enough for us to be reconciled and restored to God. God offers the way to himself, to restoration, to forgiveness. God offers a way for us to know the way our heart was supposed to be. Because don't miss this, righteousness is a gracious declaration over those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. Our faith, our trust that Jesus is enough is what God waits on to declare us righteous. That's a big deal because righteousness only comes by faith. 
But now we move on, right? Now, now we move on to what some call practical righteousness or, or how righteousness speaks to who we are in Christ. After the coming together is the going together. And, and it's this idea that when we are declared righteous, it leads to a desire to, to the deeds of righteousness and to grow in righteousness. It, it's this idea that we, when we were falling away from God, we were, where our sin drew us in a spiral down and down and down and down and down away from God. Christ picks us up and brings us up and we grow and we develop and we mature in righteousness more and more like Jesus, closer and closer to the heart of God. Righteous character and righteous living flow from resting in the fullness of God's grace and God's mercy. A shift has taken place. Our focus has changed. When we were defined or thought we were defined by what happened around us, by our circumstances, by stuff happening to us, we are now looking at the world through the eyes of Christ in us because we are declared righteous. We are more aware of how things ought to be. In the book of Philippians, Paul says this. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a righteousness from God that depends on faith. The one who is declared righteous is remarkably transformed. The thin self-centered veneer of I can just do a couple of good deeds is replaced by a substantive, rooted, anchored life. This leads to a fierce, gritty kind of love and faith due to something that is resilient and endurant. Something that can stand the test of the arrows and the spears. But this also means this. It also means that those times when I want to give up, those times when my circumstances seem to get the better of me, those times when I think there's chinks in my arm and my righteousness is just not good enough, it just ain't right. Those moments when I think that God is insufficient, that Christ is insufficient, those moments when I think that circumstances are bigger than God. The breastplate of righteousness stands firm. Because this righteousness that was declared over your life through faith in Christ is arrow proof, is spear proof, is bullet proof, is Satan proof. That righteousness no one can touch. It was designed by God eternal, God almighty. However, it reminds us that the chinks and the weaknesses hiding behind the breastplate are real. But because Christ is our righteousness, we're no longer condemned because of those weaknesses. Instead, we want to lean in closer to the Father. So what does this mean for us? It, well, it means that, that, that we need to figure out where to find this critical piece of the armor, this big piece of the armor. And, and, and the very first part of that is very simple and is almost simplistic, is in God. It is go to God. Just, just go to him. Paul writes in the same book in chapter 4, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to pastor Timothy, and here's what he says about the word of God. Look, he says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room, men and women of God, want to be equipped for every good work? I hope most of us, even though two of you raised your hand on this side. But it flows from the heart of God. It flows from the word of God because through his word, God speaks truth and that truth chisels away at the untruth, at the lies that Satan has layered over your life over time. Then thirdly, you need to overcome sin through repentance. As you grow closer to the heart of God, the lies and the deception and the sin and the brokenness of your heart is exposed. 
that you can just bring it to the Father and say, Father, please forgive me. It's about learning the ways of Jesus. It's about an honest acknowledgement of our own unrighteousness. It's about admitting that we need and that we want God. It's about accepting that Christ did everything necessary for you to walk in the ways of the Father. The key here is to remember who God says you are. Remember I said at the very beginning, what is the heart? The heart is the answer to who am I? Satan is out to lie and to destroy, and he tells you things like you're no good. Like, oh, you, you had a really good time. Yes, you had a really high experience in worship. Well, as you walk out, you'll sin because you're nothing better than a sinner. Satan will say things like, oh, you messed up. You'll always messed up. Satan will say things like you're up to no good. You're worthless. Satan will say things like, uh, just do a couple of good things. That's enough. Satan will th say things like, just follow your heart. It will give you true happiness. Satan will say things like, you are alone and no one will ever love you. Satan says, do whatever you want. No one cares. But in the same book of Ephesians, here's what God says about those who put their faith in Christ. He says that you are blessed because God is good. He says that you're chosen because God loves you and he's always loved you. God says you're adopted as God's beloved son and daughter into his family. God says you're redeemed. He paid the price because he has a great plan for your life. God says you're forgiven and you're made new in Jesus Christ. God says that you are loved unconditionally by God who pursues you daily. God says you're saved by grace through faith. You once were lost, but now you're found. God says you're his workmanship, his work of art created for his purposes to live for him and with him. God says you have an inheritance. God says you're transformed. God says that you have peace. God says you're no longer a slave to sin because Christ defeated your sin on the cross and the empty grave. And God says you're not alone because God is with you. He is the breastplate of righteousness protecting you from the enemy. That is, if you walk in faith through Christ with the Father. Here's the question in front of us when we think about this. Is why wouldn't you want to believe what God says about you? Why wouldn't you want to put your trust in God through Christ? Why would you want to choose the lies and the pain of Satan? Our sin makes us unrighteous, that's true. But we can be made righteous. We can be made who God wants us to be if we place our faith in Christ. By law of averages, there's people in this room who, who haven't done that. Maybe today is a time for you to place your faith in Christ. For you to be declared righteous. For you to believe all these truths that God speaks over those that are part of his family. If you haven't done so, I would conjure you to do that this morning. I would urge you to do that. Do not waste time. But as you go about this day and as you go about this week, as you get ready for Easter, strap on that breastplate of righteousness. You're going to need it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you speak truth and you speak life and you speak hope. And we thank you, God, that in your grace and in your peace, we can stand. And because of Christ, we can be forgiven and reconciled to you. I pray, Father, that you would speak to us this morning. I pray, Father, that you would convict those who need to come to you this morning, those who need to turn to you in faith, repent of their sin, repent of their brokenness, and admit their need for you. 
I pray, God, that you would work miracles of transformation this morning in all of our lives. That we may be able to walk and to grow in righteousness. And as we take on the world, as we take on these flaming arrows and these schemes of the devil, that, Father, that we would stand strong, that we would fight back, that we would fight well, that we would be resilient and efficient. But more than that, God, that we would stand in the love that you have for us. That we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we would love our enemies as ourselves. And that we would, Father, follow where you lead us. That we would walk in the ways of Jesus. As people of God, declared righteous. For our Father Almighty. Amen.